want to welcome everyone back to the Pickwick Club discussion of Great Expectations. We are approaching the end. We have after today's session, we have one more session in which to uh, complete the novel and talk about the um, not, not just the ending chapters that will be the assigned reading for that uh, for next month's uh, meeting, but also the entire novel, because um, we can, having finished it, having read or reread uh, or reread for the seventh time or however many times you have read Great Expectations, we can address the whole book. Um, so, uh, yes, Wayne has, Wayne, I see Wayne has joined us. Wayne, are you there? Can you hear me? Here I am. Here you are, Wayne. Here I am. Ah, I see you. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, welcome. Uh, welcome. Uh, you are our leader. Uh, you are also the president of the Pickwick Club. And it's, <laughs> uh, um, you and I discussed how we should uh, go about uh, handling the last couple of meetings of the uh, of the the club's discussion of great expectations and uh, you kindly deferred to me so i will be the the leader the discussion leader of the final session of uh, great expectations but you are today's leader and uh, i will turn things over to you at this point so everyone welcome and welcome wayne Wayne, would you like me to sh share these slides? Yeah, you go ahead with the first one. Okay. Thank you. Can you see that? Yeah, we're good. I couldn't resist using covers from Classics Illustrated uh, for starters. And the difference it seems to me between this very early one on the left and the later one, because the earlier one, which cost 10 cents, <laughs> shows, I think, a very, uh, very uh, crucial scene, which is uh, of course, someone can tell me what this scene is on the left. It's not in our current reading, but early in the novel. Poppyston and uh, Magwitch fighting in the, in the march. Absolutely, yes. During the arrest, they're getting arrested fighting. Yes. The other one, the and the other one, uh, Pip looks too old to me. Yes, much he is uh, seven, at least according to one chronology. He's supposed to be seven at the time. He looks more like eleven here, twelve. But the earlier view shows uh, the struggle between, of course, Compeyson, as you said, and and Magwitch. Whereas the later one. Uh, of course, as you know, is the opening scene. What I wanted to do is suggest that uh, the we're beginning to see how the novel is plotted because, of course, Dickens reprises this this struggle in the next reading, which John will cover next time in a I think a really thrilling climax. So this uh, the scene on the left is, of course, a foreshadowing of one of the great climaxes in the novel. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Good. I just, I'm just throwing out the, throwing these out for uh, future consideration. And we certainly don't need to try to address all of them. But uh, one of them, of course, is whether Miss Havisham's recantation is convincing or uh, affecting in any way. What have I done? What have I done? Uh, do Compi's sustained malice and surveillance of Magwitch seem probable or motivated? 
And I wanted to lay a little more ground for that in a minute as well, because he really is the villain of the story, as, as you know. Is the backstory of Stella's parents essential to the plot or just another way of, of tying up loose ends without maybe too much coincidence? Uh, is Clara necessary to establish Herbert's? She is necessary, but what about uh, her drunken father? He fits, of course, the pattern of bad parents and great expectations. Uh, in these chapters, Pip observes a softening in Providence, which accounts for what accounts for this evident shift. <laughs> like Providence, uh, Providence is softening, <laughs> or Magwitch. Uh, let's see. One critic finds Pip's moral development is arrested because he cannot recover from the childhood trauma of abuse from adults and the complicity of childlike Joe. Unlike David Copperfield, Pip is unable to accept the love of a good woman, at least in 19th century terms. So far, it's Agnes in David Copperfield and Biddy in Red Expectations, who is rendered almost totally uninteresting, in my view. And why did Dickens not introduce a formidable rival to Estella? <clears throat> and Pip, Pip does congratulate himself on the one good result of his great expectations. Someone can tell me what that is. I didn't mention it here, but Pip feels he has done one good thing with his money. <laughs> what is that? Staking Herbert. Yes. Yeah. And of course, this of course recalls a time when you bought your position. I, th I think even uh, commissions in the military were purchased, sometimes if not always. And so Pip invests capital in clerics to assure that Herbert will have a place. Uh, what is the significance of Pip's injury? Burnt hands, burnt arm. Uh, critics point out many parallels in this plot, Miss Havish and Magwitch, Pip Orlick and Orlick Drummle, this is Joe Molly, to name only a few. And this is a question I really do want to return to, how much of our pleasure in the novel is formal, resulting from our gradual recognition of the elegance of the plotting. And then last point, critics point to the tension between verisimilitude and plot. What aspects of this novel counteract the possibly overdetermined or contrived plot? Does Dickens touch the heart by one means or both? When were you moved to tears or laughter in this section of the novel? Well, I want to go on to one more slide. Next slide. If that's possible. And this goes back, of course, to that opening illustration showing Magwitch and Compeyson. So I've indulged in a little bit of our French philosopher, Michel Foucault who I would, I couldn't prove, but I think he may have read Great Expectations. <laughs> in other words, the, the influence may be a reverse chronology in this case. But I, I think it helps to explain the fascination here with the so-called criminal class. So I won't read through all of this, but uh, Foucault points out to a change in the early 19th century. And remember, the novel opens about 23 years after the French Revolution. So Dickens, as a boy, of course, grew up in the kind of the aftermath of that cataclysmic event. But we see from the very beginning in the depiction of Compeyson that his claims to status are uh, superficial. Um, his dress and his education but he is a, uh, a forger, a villain all the same. And then of course a new method of identity, uh, which was more by what you do and what you achieved than how you were born or whether or not you inherited money and status. But I think from that very beginning, we can see these two forms of status uh, in conflict and great expectations. And Pip is only re very reluctant to give up the old form. 
and I indulge on some puns on copies in here. Uh, Joe is the blacksmith, as a blacksmith, uh, accepts his place and belongs in it. But we, I think we can see in some ways the, the limitations of this old form of identity, because I, for one, can't really buy into the deification of Joe. He has severe limitations that might have shown up under the new form of identity when people are judged by what they do, not, not who they are or by their, their place in society. Uh, and then the, the magus, of course. Magus is uh, Latin for magician or shaman or sorcerer. Mag, witch. Uh, it's, uh, but he, he's not really so much a sorcerer as he is a representative, I think, of the new man of the new identity. Uh, and of course, career, uh, Herbert pursuing, pursuing a career is uh, the new person, so to speak, the new identity, form of identity. And I, I just speculate that Dickens himself never aspired to read the biographies correctly. He did aspire to affluence, which he achieved, but he never aspired to that particular status, which is so much an issue in this novel. And I, I thought it noteworthy that if you remember the climax of our mutual friend, uh, let's see, uh, the two men uh, underwater, fall into the uh, canal and uh, strangle. Let's see, I'm trying to remember uh, the names of the men right off the bat is uh, Road Riderhood and uh, it'll come to me, but uh, the school teacher are uh, dying a death grip underwater. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Remember Bradley again? Headstone. Headstone, yes, Bradley Headstone. And I think it's Rogue Riderhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who are, who die in the canal. Okay, and then uh, one more, another slide, I guess. I, this gets to the, the uh, idea of a criminal class, which at least Foucault maintains really develops in the early 19th century. So that instead of a, a criminality being a, something you could show up anywhere, it shows up in the, the, lower, the lower classes, the bottom rank of the social order. And uh, then the last point that uh, I wanna bring in here is that the the criminal class could be manipulated as a, a form of power for the upper classes. So I'll just leave that for <laughs> current consideration. Anyway, we uh, one comment that uh, Foucault does make is that uh, the drug trade is is an example of how criminality or illegality can be manipulated as actually a form of profit for the so-called non-criminal classes. Okay, and uh, then I promise, so we'll go on to another slide. This gets, I think, to the, oh, I, I had to throw this in because Joe's, the fact that Joe's uh, Sunday's clothing doesn't fit is, it's a way of understanding that he really is not a gentleman. <laughs> he belongs in his blacksmith's clothing. But here, here's a men's fashion from about uh, 1810 to 1820. And I put in the picture of the naval the captain because apparently this still stands in uh, the family's country house and it still gets attention from the tourists. <laughs> That this is what a, a real gentleman would have looked like uh, in his, in his uh, captain's uniform about the time the novel opens. 
Okay, and one more slide. <laughs> and this is just a summary of the action. We don't have to go through all of this. But I wanted to ask you, uh, there are maybe four major patterns in this part of the novel. One, the first one that overlaps with the previous reading is the uh, fate of Miss Havisham and her immolation. So I thought we might begin there and I'd like to get your responses about this development. Uh, I, I kind of feel sorry that unlike uh, Don Giovanni in the opera goes you know, uh, right into the mouth of hell at the end and the audience always loves it. But are, are you, are you uh, affected by Miss Havisham's incantation and her immolation? Sarah, see you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, di I didn't raise my hand. Okay, I just see you. I, yeah, I just played this computer. So, uh, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with Don Giovanni, but at the end of the opera, the mouth of hell opens to receive him and he walks in boldly, totally unrepentant for all that he's done. <laughs> but Miss Havisham pretends to feel uh, regret at least for what, what she's done with Estella and Pip. Havisham, I think, does yeah. have a genuine uh, softening uh, and, and a realization that while she is trying to make mm -hmm. uh, Estella into uh, 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 an arc of revenge, what she really has done is destroyed any chance Estella has in life as she is married to someone who is acknowledged to be a brute. But I think even with her change of heart, her regret of what she has done to Estella and Pip, um, in Dickens' worldview, and, and, and this is sort of a melodrama, she needs to be punished. And, uh, you know, it's not enough. It's too little, too late. And I think this is, you know, her punishment and Tip's real chance to be sort of a hero, uh, which he doesn't often have because he, he's not True. of that material. True. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, Glenna, you have a hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think I find this scene to be very powerful. I think that Miss Havisham's scheme of using Estella to, you know, wreak revenge is abstract. And, you know, I think it's perfectly human to have abstract revenge plots that you cook up. And um, I mean, not that I, I have no personal acquaintance with this, but I think it's <laughs> I think it's observable that people have these abstract schemes. And then when you see the real human toil, toll, mm -hmm. I should say, um, it it changes your, you know, you have you might well have that kind of sudden realization. And I think, you know, the point that was just made that um that somehow in a melodrama she has to be punished, I find that plausible, but uh, I find this a very moving scene, and I find it entirely plausible. I have to admit, I can never read this without thinking about the sad fate of uh, Butterfly McQueen, who played the memorable part of Prissy in Gone with the Wind. Does anyone remember Prissy? Well, when she was about 85 and living in, I think, Augusta, Georgia, uh, winters are short in the South, but the Southern cold is very cold. So Butterfly McQueen was trying to light a kerosene heater in her house when her Prenoir, who was, was probably very lacy and fluffy, caught fire and she died. 
and a horrible way to die. <laughs> but anyway, that's uh, Mrs. Miss Havisham's fate always brings to mind the actual real thing that did happen. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. So, uh, yeah, I also thought that, that the, the scene was absolutely beaut beautiful. And uh, in a way, it really uh, showed Pip's maturing and his sensitivity because he handled a very, very difficult situation a, a, a very compassionately and very beautifully. And um, I, I think we talked in the last session uh, uh, why he asks money from his Avisham and not uh, from the convict. And uh, she wronged him too. And she knows that she wronged him too because she, she knew she's, he, he thinks wrongly that she's a benefactor and he made a decision based on that. And that's why she invites him to give him the money for his friend and she offers him money. And, and, and this was all very, very much from the heart. And also the advice that Pip gives her at the end is just amazing. Like he said, all the wrong that was done was done and hurt Estella, but you can still correct some of it now. You can treat it in a way, treat her in a way um, that will soften her now a little bit. So I, I thought it was an amazing, amazing, it mesmerized me. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if we have any psychologists or psychiatrists in the group. <laughs> Anyone tempted to diagnose Ms. Havisham if she's um, mentally ill up to this point? I'm tempted to call her obsessive compulsive. In the 19th century, she might have been termed early 20th century, hysterical and, his, and, and hysteric. <laughs> so if so, this, this scene- Margaret her has her hand getting raised. Getting over all that somehow. Please go ahead, Margaret. Okay, I can't answer this psychological question, but I'm very happy to read Dickens without any psychological labels and to okay. read <laughs> the, uh, the wonderful characterizations he has. But could you please, Wayne, go, Wayne, could you go back over? Is, is somebody talking with me? Uh, uh, Wayne, could you uh, go back over that scene where Ms. Havisham writes, I forgive her. On um, what document is that? And does she want, does she want Pip to, uh, to sign something under it. I, I was a little confused in, in that scene. And I thought that also, I forgive her could be Miss Havisham forgiving Estella. So, I mean, the, these are just, this is just how the layers and layers of Dickens uh, lands on me. Yes, anyway. yes. So th can you answer it for me, please? Well, first thing that comes to my mind is that this recantation is similar to Mrs. Joe's when just before she dies, she writes like, please forgive somewhere. I'm trying to find the yeah. Havisham reference. I, I think she writes down her name and she said, please put under the, my name, I forgive her. And I thought this should be the writing on the tomb. That's what she wants. The writing of the what? On the tomb, like on the grave, you know, the tombstone. Oh, okay. Okay. That's on my understanding because she gives him a paper and she writes her name and she said, underneath it, you have to write, I forgive her. And you're right. I also wondered who forgives whom. Because it's her name, I forgive. And I wonder the same questions about who forgives whom. Yes, yeah, it's a good point. Let's see, immolation of Miss Havisham. And the, I, I forgive her might be the advice that Pip told her, you can still correct something. Because they need to forgive one another, actually. True. True. Yeah. Yes. 
if you are looking for the exact place in the Oxford Illustrated Edition, it's the very last of chapter uh, 49. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm not good, very good at operating one handed here. Let's see. The first time that um, that Miss Havisham says that before she gets set on fire, before she gets on fire, in the uh, um, Penguin, it's on page three ninety eight, and she says, "My name is on the first leaf." She's talking to Pip, and she says, "My name is on the first leaf. If you can ever write under my name, I forgive her, though ever so long after my broken heart is dust. Pray do yeah. it." And Pip says, "Oh, Miss Havisham," said I, "I can do it now." So I thought she was asking Pip to forgive her for what she had done. Is that right? I I I, 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 the penguin, if you guys have the penguin. He, he forgave her in this uh, scene. He already forgave her. That's why I doubt, you know, and she gives him the money and he already, he already tells her with all the hurt that you caused, there were a lot of good things in our relationship. And mm -hmm. then she offers the money. So I think with him, she feels she's already forgiven. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's between her and Estella, I feel. And Pip says I, I can't do it. I think that it's um, her asking Pip for forgiveness, as you said, because she directly asks him to put it in writing, even though he has already been saying it's okay, because he says to her, I want forgiveness and direction far too much to be bitter with you. And so he wants him to put in writing, I forgive her, meaning mm -hmm. Pip forgives Miss Havish for what she did and ruining his life. So we're kind of looking at a consensus that the Ms. Havisham's recantation and immolation is a, a affecting scene, or a, it seems valid to us anyway. Wayne, um, yes, just to me, and I'm not a real good reader of all this, but it seems kind of confusing to us. And I'm just wondering if Dickens wanted it to be very confusing, because sometimes I'm thinking, mm -hmm. you know, because forgiveness is, it seems like it is to Miss Havisham, but, you know, like he says, well, if what you mean is that, then I forgive you. But it seems like even Pip or the narrator, older Pip, um, I may be way off, but doesn't doesn't really understand who's being asked to be forgiven. And I kind of right. thought the same thing with uh, Mrs. Joe. That was just all very, so these forgiveness things are very weird <laughs> to me. Alexis? Uh, yes. <laughs> the, 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 the whole book is just filled with, with guilt. Pip, Pip from day one is feeling overwhelming guilt for you know stealing the pork pie he is guilty throughout himself he has things to make up he has a lot of making up to do to joe and biddy you know and and this whole bit of him being a gentleman he'll never be a gentleman anyone finds out the origins of, of that boy where he was born that he was in the forge till what age 14 he will never be considered a gentleman it's all birth you know, and the falsity of that, you know, and, and, and the falsity, and, he, and he's horrified at the origins of Estella. I mean, she was the, the lady, the beautiful lady, you know, and where did she come from? From a convict and a, 
uh, I, you know, the the false uh, the falsity, and we all owe, I think, a debt of guilt to someone. Everyone is guilty. Everyone has someone they could do that type of apology to, not to the extreme of Pip um, and Miss Havisham, but uh, he he retains his false values, you know. Magwitch, who is the convict with the heart of gold, it turns out, who wants to to make it Pip into something he himself could never be, you know, and, and Pip is horrified and, and won't even take a, a quarter from him now, you know, um, and how is his money any any cleaner or dirtier than Miss Havisham's? It's just money, you know, and money does not make a gentleman, it, but Drummel who is an absolute brute, is a gentleman. You know, Pip, who has finer feelings, is not. And and it's just so, you know, Pip would have been perfectly happy if he had never met Estella. He was a happy enough little boy at the forge, you know, and, and, and Joe was his big overgrown playmate. And But the minute Estella said, oh, you have such coarse hands and such coarse boots, you know, all of a sudden he's not good enough because he's seen through these very false eyes with his very false set of values. Herbert, who doesn't have a dime either, is a gentleman because of his birth. You know, his mother's always going on about their wonderful birth. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Dickens was never a gentleman. He was a very rich, self-made, very successful, talented genius, but he was not a gentleman. He wanted to be a gentleman and had a phony coat of arms, you know, it's just like uh, uh, the whole society is just rot. It's interesting what you say about Drummle really reminds me what Jaggers says of Drummle. He's a spider and Drummle is a perfect example of that older form of identity that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Identity by status. Drummle has money and status, but he seems like a thoroughly horrible person. And as if to prove it, he later beats Estella, which seems to have, that, that's a theme, by the way, that runs through Dickens novels that never ceases to strike me. The, uh, Joe's father, as he said, hammered his mother inst instead of working, hammering at the forge. <laughs> but uh, Drummle is, is that uh, an impeachment of this, this idea of gentleman for sure, yes. And the second, th second thing that came up, made me, you made me think, one of the few scenes where we get some substance about Biddy, she's, uh, Pip, I think, confides into her, his, to, confides to her about his attraction for us to Estella. And, uh, and he says, well, gee, Biddy, I might have even married you. And Biddy says, oh, I'm not particular. And then she says, but the chance for that has gone. <laughs> so, great scene. <laughs> she says, it's too late, Pip. <laughs> so if uh, the other pattern here is the, uh, the preparations for escape and the uh, difficulty of surveillance that, that Pip gradually learns, the surveillance by Compasson assisted by Orlick. So that um, this is just wonderful action plotting here. And the, the whole business about rowing and not being, not being uh, detected or observed in their practice rowing. But it does involve uh, the point I, I brought up earlier about Compison's malice. And is it credible or understandable that Compison would go to the extent of actually uh, going to Australia to spy on Magwitch? And then later on employs Orlick and continues to, uh, to watch uh, Provost Magwitch until the very end. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, in other words, is his character motivated sufficiently? Does this just seem like a, 
too much villainy for any one person. Yes, yes, please. Oh, John had a hand up too. Go ahead and then, then John. Yes, please. Mark. Yeah, the whole, I think obsession is a big theme though. I mean, Miss Havisham, it suffers from obsession and so does Compasson and so does Pip himself. He's absolutely obsessed with Estella beyond all reason, beyond her, her dreadful treatment of him. So I think this is, you know, maybe it's not anything we can really understand, but I think it's in, in place with the, with the uh, themes of the book. Uh, would you say Compasson, although he's seems like a minor character in some ways actually a major character in driving the plot but he gets some kind of sick satisfaction out of taking advantage of Madwich, Magwitch and Provis and and wants to pursue that to the very end yeah okay please go ahead oh John John first I'm sorry John I I, I unmute it yes um I I wanted us to before we left the scene of Miss Havisham's recantation, which we talked about in interesting ways. I I was wondering why she has to burn up. Why is it, why burning? What what's the significance of, of Miss Havisham burning and then Pip being the one to put her out? And he doesn't put her out with a you know a hose or a pail of water, uh, he throws a cloak over her and then he lies on top of her and smothers the fire. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful, active scene and he's burned as a result. So why, what does it mean? I mean, we don't have to think psychologically necessarily, but, but symbolically, why? Why, why fire? I've got some hands of Virginia. Virginia? So, I, well, I would say to answer that question, I think it's because she feels like she should go to hell for what she's done. And so fire burning her is like being sent to hell, but Pip rescuing her is the idea that no John isn't that horrible you deserve a chance to you know forgiveness you realize what you did was wrong and so he's able to save her um at that time of course you wouldn't have running water in the house so it makes total sense that the only way you put out a fire like that is with you know a blanket or a tablecloth or his coat or all the things to be able to pull it's not like anybody was sitting with running water nearby but I think the whole act of him being throwing himself into the fire with her because equally involved in this whole idea of putting Estelle on a pedestal and looking at her life when she turned out to be the child of two criminals and he thought she was the end all and then Miss Aversham was trying to you know do what, what she wanted with her and so I think both sort of were like struggling in the burning fire and coming out on the other side and and Pip being burned as part of it um, but also uh, her suffering more because what her her work was a greater evil in my mind because she out to ruin her life by, you know, giving her all these ideas about what it was like. And then I just, the other thing I want to say is about Compasson. I think that he's, this is a great rivalry. Like these two have hated each other over the ages, like the prison ship, they start out fighting in the beginning of the novel. They both get deported to Australia. They can, can't, they can't leave each other alone. You each feel they've been wronged. And anytime they're going to, you know, have a chance to wreak revenge with Compasson being much more wanting that final revenge than Magwitch, because he, Pip to, you know, be give hope to his life. You know, th those were my thoughts on those two things. Yes, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Compasson is. I like think I've got my Stop. hand up. I want to take it down. Yeah. I don't know how to do it. Sita, you had your hand up. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to get back to the theme of forgiveness. I just feel that that is so fundamental in underscoring so much of the event, so many of the events that happen, and that I forgive her is a 
uh, is an edict, but it's not necessary for us to figure out who needs forgiveness and who needs to forgive because it's like the story of the Garden of Eden. It's like the story of Cain and Abel. Who do you forgive? What do we do to deserve forgiveness? And I think that, uh, you know, forgiving oneself is certainly underscoring all the sins and uh, missteps of all the characters, forgiving oneself. And I think that's what Pip has to do is to forgive himself. And I, I think he does. Okay. Now, if I can just shut myself up. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. I don't know. Oh, God. All right. Carry on. Yeah. Peter? Peter? Oh, as far as uh, Compasson being like uh, overdone, I mean, consider Rigo and uh, like little Rigo and little Dorrit. He's a pretty melodramatic villain. And Compasson's role in the in the novel, I think, uh, in this novel is to be another example of the gentleman gone bad. It's like uh, he's he seems to be a gentleman himself, and you know, had to have, or a, a sort of the rump end of some sort of like a some sort of gentlemanly dynasty, some sort of dynasty of some sort. sort. And uh, but he's a con artist uh, because he seems to have lost his ability to sort of. Sort of you know, his economic foundation, whatever. And so, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't feel particular. I think he's a, I think he's a central figure in terms of like becoming uh, an example of what the gentleman has become. It's like an, a, a corrupt, a corrupt upper class, you know, criminal. You know, but, um, so anyway, I'm curious, um, you know, later on maybe, uh, no, the, I think you mentioned something about Orlick, um, uh, and his, he uses Orlick, and Orlick says, "Well, I was go he, Orlick is actually uh, trying to get even with Pip. All Orlick cares about is finding out where Pip is, so he can actually do something to Pip, and he just happens to be conveniently also." Uh, snooping around and finding out about Provis, and he happens to be associated with as a as a, a criminal, you know, with with Compison because he doesn't have a means of making a living or something. But but he doesn't act. He's not actually deliberately trying to seek out Provis. He's trying to find out find Pip, you know, to do damage to Pip, and in the process, he becomes useful to Compison, you know, as a as uh, because he's also finding out about you know, Probus. So it's, it's a very complicated sort of situation. Uh, you know, he's not, he's not deliberately looking for Probus. He just kind of happens to find him, you know, in the process of doing his own bad, his own evil, you know, strange. But and then later on, when we talk about Oriel later on, there's this very peculiar moment in an oral ex uh, explanation of his motives that I find very Oh, yes. I, I want to get back to Orlick, too. Uh, Compasson, again, reminds me of the melodramatic villain, which the audience, whom the audience always loves, if you've ever been at a revival of a melodrama, when the villain comes in in his black clothing, the audience just goes crazy. <laughs> That's good. And I don't think the melodramatic villain ever recounts. He's, he walks straight in the mouth of hell, as does Compis in, in a sense. Let's see, Karen had a hand up. Yeah, um, going back to the question of fire and why fire, when I think of fire, I think of purification. And if you look at a lot of the rituals around fire, there's a cleansing of the soul, it's a renewal, there's transformative power in fire. We have things like the eternal flame. We have the notion of light my fire, which has more of a sexual connotation, I think, or enlightenment. 
And what do we do at year's end? Out here in New Mexico, we have an old man gloom burning. It's the Zazobra Festival. You burn your memories at the end of the year and bur burn your sins or your regrets or whatever to become purified and to transform into something more pure. So I think the whole use of fire from a purification notion is what I really read into that scene. Very interesting. And of course, I can't resist adding a little footnote again. From reality, uh, Ralph Waldo's Emer L. Emerson's wife at the time would, would have been wearing uh, voluminous skirts, crinolines, the crinolines were called, but her skirts caught in fa on fire, I think at the, at the hearth and she died. <laughs> Never, I think that was Waldo's That was that part wife. on Ralph Waldo. <laughs> Go ahead, please. That was Longfellow's um, wife. Longfellow, before... not, 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 it was Longfellow's wife. Okay. Yes. <laughs> before I give up the floor, could I make one, one more Wait. comment about um, Biddy? I guess I take a little issue um, with what you said, Wayne, in the very beginning um, about Biddy in the sense that I think that really, really good people who usually always do the right thing can be a little boring sometimes. <laughs> and I don't mean that as a pejorative. It's a very positive thing, but they're not, they don't perhaps seem as developed or something. Biddy happens to be one of my favorite characters. So of course, I would have to take you on about that a bit. But I think goodness sometimes comes out of simplicity and understatement. Um, and just allowing others around someone to develop in their own way without being more directive. So that's just my thing on Biddy. Yeah, you might say, I, I agree. Actually, my one of my many unpublished manuscripts, I actually write about Biddy in those terms. That she she doesn't have an elaborate theatrical story, but she reads Pip very clearly and ultimately Joe. And what she says is often profound. Too bad, of course, Pitt can't really appreciate her. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Send send me a copy of that unpublished manuscript. I'd love okay. to. Okay. <laughs> oh well, are you sure? <laughs> if it's it's a good uh soporific. There yeah. David is okay. well, Alexis has been waiting. Yeah quite a while oh, okay I'd like to hear yeah. what she's saying Alexis yeah I just wanted to get back to the burning uh, I find you know the melodramatic part Miss Hag Havisham is a witch-like figure and of course the witches were always burned and in that scene uh, Pip sort of glances up and he thinks he sees Miss Havisham hanging you know sort of an execution kind of uh, theme I think in, in that as well as purification yeah, actually, he has scenes very similar to the scenes that you described about a flames. Like in Jagger's home, he sees the flames mm -hmm. and it reminds him of all the hanged men. Mm -hmm. So he has several scenes where he talks about fire. One of the scenes, I think, the first night that he goes to this house to, uh, uh, because he has a warning not to return to his home and he sits there, this terrible a room and he also all the lights that he keeps talking about it. And also the same with the fire with Miss Abisham, it starts by him seeing some illusion. He sees some fire that is not real. So it's almost like he has an instinct to go back and check on her and then there is a real fire. Thank you, that's, that's also good. David. Okay. Several disconnected thoughts. Uh, I thought Peter was saying some very good things. Uh, in coming at this section, I realized that I've always found Orlick uh, doesn't quite fit. And I came up with a thought experiment 
Dickens complains a lot in his letters about having to compress his story to the space available. If the publisher had suddenly said to him, before we put this out in book format, can you expand it by a quarter? What would Dickens have done differently? My feeling is, as the discussion has been saying, that Compeyson and Orlick are not satisfactory. I had something else I was going to say, but as I've lost it, I'll stop. <laughs> it will come back to you, David, and so we'll go on to Glenna. Glenna. Well, I, the historian has to weigh in on the subject of fire. In days when cooking was done at an open hearth and women wore long skirts, these kind of domestic accidents, I mean, we know about Longfellow's wife because he was famous, but for every famous person that um, had a domestic accident, I mean, it was tragically common. And of course, fire itself, I've read in the history of, of San Francisco, for example, I can't remember how many devastating fires there were in San Francisco in the early days. So fire was an absolutely, as somebody pointed out, no running water, there weren't hydrants. It took a while to organize a fire brigade. Um, and so this is not, I mean, it's, it has a melodramatic feel in this plot, but it's tragically common in ordinary life. The combination of the fabrics they used and open flames led to a lot of injuries and deaths. One that sticks in my mind in Paris, uh, the lead dancer in Offenbach's ballet, Papillon, got too close to the footlights, which were, of course, gas. And she died as a result of the flames. So this, this was just something that people kind of took for granted. My question would be, shouldn't uh, Ms. Havisham have burned up decades earlier? <laughs> running around in this, in this ratty dress in a room with fire, you know, it's because it, if it were an accident, if it were just an accident and not symbolic, she would have burned up like decades earlier. So it's, kind of, I, I, you know, I, it's got to be symbolic or something or other. It's like not, not plausible that she, was, she wasn't incinerated dick years ago. Okay, sorry. No, I think there is something about uh, uh, association with witchcraft there, too, and uh, self-destruction. She doesn't deliberately set fire, but she has basically destroyed her, if not destroyed her life, greatly attenuated her own life. And so this is, a, uh, I guess, a fitting end to that. I don't want to go off too much, but it's so sad. Anybody remembers the, the young man? I think he was a military man who immolated himself to protest the war in Gaza. And it made the news for one day and has been forgotten. Really pathetic thing. Ernie. <clears throat> well, I think it's symbolic, but, uh, you know, Miss Havisham, it, and I think of, you know, her life, she did all these um, not very good things, uh, manipulating people and so forth, and just wasn't fit to, fit to live. And so she burnt up just like crook, spontaneously combusted. I mean, it, it seems like maybe Dickens could have just had her spontaneously combust. <laughs> yeah. an optative, optative way of saying it, <laughs> doing it. Well, Peter's Peter's point that it's a wonder that she didn't catch on fire sooner than this because she's been in this ratty house in this dress that she never takes off and it's 
just waiting to catch fire, um, you know, but Dickens wants it at this particular point because it, in the story because it has uh, symbolic uh, value as punishment, as purification, as uh, e even, you know, because she's wearing her wedding dress, even as this the long postponed and never consummated wedding night. Um, this it's a, it's a it, it's a it's a scene that has multiple possible significance, um, and I I think we need to keep the complexity of it in play rather than than say it's one thing and one thing only. But Clark, I just I I'm unfamiliar with lots of Dickens fiction, I, and all I know is the spontaneous combustion in Bleak House, but does Dickens use this elsewhere in other other novels? Does he have, does he use fire in this way? Or is this a I think so. idiosyncratic choice for this novel? I'm not thinking of any other instances okay. where, uh, where a character burns up completely besides the spontaneous combustion in Bleak House. And there is quite a difference because with spontaneous combustion, there's nothing, it doesn't seem like there's any possibility of any uh, of the good things coming out of it, of the change. And so it's a change, but it's just a disaster. I mean, Crook is just too bad to burn up as a fire. Margaret. Uh, hello, uh, I'm wondering how Miss Havisham has become this monster in this discussion, when after all, she is a terrible victim whose whole life is victimhood and she has suffered so much and she's suffering within her mind. She's deranged, of course, but the suffering was placed upon her by Compasson and uh, she is the victim. And she thought the, that she was doing Estella good, a good deed by raising her that way so that Estella would be free of this horrible suffering that Miss Havisham experienced. So I just wonder how in this discussion, Miss Havisham became the monster. <laughs> so you can all answer and uh, pile in on her. <laughs> no, but I, good, good reminder, good reminder. Thank you. David. I would make the point uh, that suffering does not necessarily improve anybody's character. Uh, at the moment, it's a complicated situation in Gaza. Uh, one can't feel that the character of Israelis has been improved by the horrible suffering they experienced in World War II. Uh, be, having been martyred doesn't justify doing anything you choose. Thereafter is revenge. Sorry about th throwing this controversial subject in, but it, it, Ms. Havisham is not justified by the suffering she has experienced. Sarah. And she created her own yeah, suffering. I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to say very simply that remember the timing she catches on fire after she repents. She has an insight. What have I done? What have I done? So to me, it's not so much punishment as it is repentance. And again, the whole notion of purification or transformation, but that might be a stretch. <laughs> No, I think it's important to think of the, the sequence of those events. But 
Sarah and then Glenna. Sarah, you're muted. So was it Margaret who brought up the question, why do we look at Miss Avisham as a monster? Yes. Yeah, okay. So so uh, 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 Margaret is right that when uh, we are believing Miss Avisham when she said that she wanted to adopt a daughter to help her. Uh, so she doesn't have to suffer the way Miss Avisham suffered. But but the reality is, uh, it's like a reality of children who grow up in a broken home. Maybe Pip is an example of such a child, and I think we brought it up earlier, that they, they promise themselves and they know, I won't do the same to my child, or my home will be different. But the reality is, that we end up duplicating the home that you grew up in, all the bad stuff that happens there, happens in our new home that we create. And I think that's what happened with Miss Abisham. She suffered a lot and she got distorted with the suffering with a very strong sense of revenge. Uh, and, uh, 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 and her good intentions she couldn't accomplish them. She couldn't perform. She couldn't because she, she she was already too damaged. So when she saw that Estella is so beautiful, the idea of, of the revenge came up. Okay, she's a good candidate. And I just want to answer, David, I am from Israel. Mm -hmm. And I just want to cry at what you said, because don't talk about the children who die in Gaza without saying that they are human shields, that the Hamas uses them at human, as human shields. We cannot protect Israel. We cannot. What can we do? We cannot destroy any of their arms because children are there. So if we talk about the suffering of children, we have to mention that they are used as human shields. And we have to mention what Hamas did on October 6th. They came into homes of people, no more nothing, and burned babies in front of their mothers. So I, I say when we talk, we need to talk about everything. That's all. What you say brings to mind, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. That uh, about the child replicating the family in which he grew up and Joe, of course, who's supposed to be a saint-like figure, but in my opinion is not. But he replicates the abuse that he suffered from his father. He allows it to occur to, to Pip. And uh, so I think that bears out exactly what you say, that Pip ends up a, a abused and trauma traumatized child very much the way Joe was. And one could say, well, that, that's the way children were raised in the 19th century. <laughs> well, it could be. <laughs> Maybe not in that extreme cruelty, all, always. Let's see. Uh, Lena. Was, Lena, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to say, first of all, Margaret, I, I am struck by what you said, that we shouldn't see uh, Ms. Havisham in holy negative terms. In fact, you could almost make an argument for her as proto-feminist that she's um, she sees all the um, possible suffering, trauma of that a beautiful young woman might be subject to, and she's trying to do her best to protect. But I also think that, um, and I, you. You have no idea who I'm talking about, so I'm not violating anyone's privacy. But I have one friend who had an unhappy love affair decades ago, and she is still, well, she's actually a recluse now, but um, she has made that that um, rupture with this particular man the centerpiece, centerpiece of her life. It has distorted the rest of her life. And I think in a way, when, when a person, man or woman, chooses to make a particular wrong the focal point of their conscious life and 
live their life around it, they are in a kind of hell. Uh, you know, so the, the symbolic fire that Miss Hamilton uh, eventually, um, well, it eventually kills her, is a physical manifestation of the hell she's been living in, but she had a choice to make. She didn't have to focus her whole life on being wrong. And as I say, I find this all too plausible because I know at least one person of whom this is true. Well, oh, Alexis? Uh, yes, Go I ahead. agree with that. People in this novel are making their own hell. Miss, Miss Havisham has destroyed her own life by refusing refusing to change, refusing to, to accept reality, and, and she's throwing away happiness, and um, Estella is throwing away happiness with, with both hands. You know, P Pip adores her and would be good to her, but no, she needs the guy with more class, more position, more money, you know, and Pip throws away happiness. He would have been happy back at the forge had he married Biddy, who was very sweet on him. She was very much taken with him and he would have been a happy young man. But but everybody, you know, wants these sort of false things and, uh, you know, they destroy their own lives. An obsession, you know, Miss Havisham just can't let go. She cannot let go of this one incident in her life. And she could have had a whole life. She could have been happy raising little Estella just to be sort of a normal kind of child instead of trying to weaponize her. And, uh, <laughs> you know, everybody's just throwing away. The only people who don't throw away happiness are, are people like Herbert. You know, he's very, he perseveres. He has great difficulties with that 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 sweetheart with the horrible father, but but he he perseveres and he he finds happiness. Apparently, Dickens was pretty rough on his children, so uh, from what I've read, anyway, that he was not a very indulgent father. Peter and then Dorothy. Well, you know, it's a, it's, it's not just in this novel. Uh, Miss Wade is like a, like a, what, a quote, a self tormentor, you know, in, uh, in uh, like Little Dora. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's a type. Miss Havisham is actually a type that appears. To, I guess there's got to be so. Who's, who's her, like. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Bleak House. Who's the woman in Bleak House? Uh, Esther. No, not Esther. The 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 woman who's uh, the uh, Hortense, the murderer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Forget it. And but there's there there are multiple instances of of this sort of uh, like like fixation, like fixation. Uh, uh, they see characters who seem to get fixated on something or other and uh and it's usually you know and they end up being they end up tor torturing themselves in the process of, of of like trying to get trying to get revenge or trying to like you know um like miss way too is, is another example of that but um anyway so that's that's just my uh they're just saying that it's not it's not and w what they uh, what they seem to lack is some sort of some sort of Dickens that other people this the ability to forgive or to sort of they lack some sort of religious principle that says you know allows you to sort of like you know forgive other people or to like you know let the past be past and and go on and treat other people decently you know, even though you've been damaged, you know, yourself by someone, you don't, you don't take it out on other people. It's some sort of Christian principle that seems to be missing in these, these characters. They lack, they lack some sort of value, some sort of value to, you know, they can't see that revenge is not a viable option for existence, <laughs> existing, you know. I, I can just say that it, it seems well like you want them to be or Alexi wants them to be, 
we wouldn't have that many good books. <laughs> So good, people, good people are boring. We we need villains or <laughs> or tragic. Well, but reality is complex. <laughs> you know, if people have mental issues, you don't just you cannot just say get over it. It's not yeah. simple. I take your point. Yes. Yeah. Very 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 true, Dorothy. The expression hurt people, hurt people the first being an adjective, the second a verb. And I'm reminded of the Peloponnesian War and the different actions taken against Miletus and uh, uh, Milos. The Melian dialogue, I, am I not met, mentioning things anybody's familiar with? Three years into the Peloponnesian War, Miletus rebels and Athens decides to kill all of the men and enslave the women and children. And then the next day, after they've sent out a boat to do that, they reassemble on the Pnyx and rescind that. And when they hear that the second ship has arrived in time to avert the calamity, all Athens rejoices. 15 years into the war, 12 years later, little Milos simply wants to pull a Switzerland, simply wants to be neutral. And Athens again sends out a ship and actually does kill all the men and enslave the women and children because hurt people hurt people. War makes people cruel. Cruelty makes people cruel. And Dickens is just carrying that out. The sad truth. David. Uh, I have a tendency always to go off with tangents. The other thing I meant to say was that someone could do an interesting study of good characters in literature. Authors have tried writing them, starting with Richardson, with Clarissa, and Sir Charles Grandison. You get Dostoevsky's The Idiot, and there are a good many more, some of whom even are successful. It's not, good people are not necessarily dull. <laughs> okay. Margaret. Yes, in, in Great Expectations, this is a question for all of you. What profession demands no credentials or legal documents behind it? Anyone can answer it. Because there are many professions that are explored in it wonderfully. Nobody's going to give a stab at this. Funeral, funeral director. <laughs> well, even that has is a lot of protocol with it. No, I, I'm suggesting that it is Biddy's profession. It is a teaching profession. What, what school does she go to? What credentials does she have? She has experience, but she doesn't have to have been an apprentice like a blacksmith. And even she doesn't have to have the, uh, the background of an actor. So uh, why, not, uh, why not give a comment, please, from all the people who are in the, in the uh, teaching profession from the highest to the grade school? I was thinking the profession that requires no background credentials or anything is writer. You don't have to have any kind of credential at all. Mm. Well, yes, but in, in the book, in Great Expectations, Biddy is countering Pip's 
you know, he says to her, what are you going to do after, you know, you're not taking care of my mother? And then she, then she provides a, a fulsome answer, you know, that yeah. she is going to pursue teaching from what she has learned in the past, just from, uh, from learning on her own. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's just a point I'm making about within the book, within, within Great Expectations that uh, we, see, we see into uh, the different professions and uh, in teaching, it's all hell breaks, breaks loose. <laughs> That's all I have to say. So does the acting with the acting, exactly, exactly, yeah. Virginia. Yeah, I would say it's not necessarily always teaching that didn't require any credentials. I think Biddy is in a very small village where there are very few educated people. And I don't think Biddy could go off to Cambridge and be a teacher or Oxford or into a big city. I think people there, if they expect a little bit more from them, a knowledge of the classics and a knowledge of different subjects, whereas Biddy's in a very small village and she's gonna teach them the basics of reading, writing and math that she knows. And you, in a lot of those places, if you didn't have people who are willing to volunteer their time, it's not like they're you know paying big bucks to be a teacher in those days. And I just know from a lot of the novels I've read around that time period, it really depends where you're teaching. Like Biddy's Village, they're probably so lucky to have somebody that'd be willing to teach. And you're right, she doesn't have any specific credentials other than she can read and write and can help others who cannot, um, as opposed to if she was teaching at a different level in a different area where they had some choice in the kinds of teachers they had, they might want more credentials. That'd just be my thought on it. Most of the teaching that went on was at schools established by the Church of England for quite a while. Every generation has a new profession where you don't need credentials. My wife's father and mother neither graduated from college and they most, both made careers in radio to start with. The, my mother-in-law died before uh, I would have had a chance to meet her, then went on to television and became a producer. In my generation, a number of people who'd started out not terribly well, computers, you didn't have a piece of paper you just you just did it, and a number of people married, made very good careers out of that. There was the entertaining situation for some while, where middle management was managing people who were doing things with the company's computers, and the middle manager didn't know diddly squat about them and was sort of having to take the, the word of the technicians. Mm. digression yeah i was thinking of uh i was thinking of like uh herbert pocket's father is a also a, a teacher and uh you know there's nicholas nickleby so the idea that that all you had needed to do to open a school uh in victorian england was to hang out a shingle is a uh, is a constant sort of like motif in Dickens. The wrong people are hanging out shingles and opening up schools and, and trying to teach. But I, when I, when you ask that question, you know, the profession that you don't have to have credential for, my immediate thought was like parent. You know, it's like parent, mother or father. There are plenty of bad parents in Dickens. You know, you know people who never have had kids. Or, and uh, so anyway, teachers, I guess, teachers, you know, and then and mothers, mothers like Mrs. Jellyby, you know, she's a bad parent. Uh, uh, so there, it's like, that's, that's, a, that's a, a problem in Dickens, two bad parents. Bad teachers, bad parents. This might be it. Uh, time to move on to Orlick. I think it'd be a shame to leave him out. And uh, <clears throat> of course, the standard interpretation of Orlick is that he's so-called shadow figure for Pitt, that he is everything that Pitt 
should not be all the all the bad things that Pip has avoided avoided show up in Orlick. So that makes this 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 uh, confrontation at the Slew's house, I think, uh, a very I think a very powerful theme when Orlick uh, accuses Pip of having really caused the attack on Mrs. Joe. <laughs> I did it for you, he says. So. Yes, and it's, someone brought this up as to whether Orlick is um, not developed enough or developed too much, but I think he's, he does provide an interesting uh, reflection of Pip. Actually, I think that what Orlick says is not, I did it for you, but you did it yes yeah. yes you did it which is yeah. A, yeah. a remarkable thing to say because he has just acknowledged that that he did it but then he turns around and says no you did it how about seeing orlick as parallel to miss havisham somebody who's fixated on his past and refused to leave it. I think that works. I've always wondered, Pip describes Orlick as a journeyman who, if I'm not mistaken, would have some training, but for some reason has not become a master. So Orlick is, has a strange status with Pip, who is apprenticed and has the chance at least to become a master blacksmith. But for some reason, Orlick seemed to be stuck there as a journeyman. It seems to be somewhat mentally defective or something. <laughs> True, yeah. Probably, probably like from drinking too much or something. And I was just constantly swinging, <laughs> whatever, you know, in the in the scene where he's like attacking Pip, he's swigging. Um, um, I was I was struck this time reading through. I was struck by a very peculiar. Uh, he accuses Pip of being sneaky you know it's kind of like it's like uh, orlick is really mentally fucked up uh he says he says something about about compison he says compison has he writes 50 hands meaning he, he writes 50 hands meaning he's a con artist so, so he's capable of like you know uh uh creating you know cr creating um uh, forgeries you know the 50 hands that's not like sneaking you as rights but one. Wait, what's this about writing one hand, having one hand or being, you know, using your own script? There's nothing sneaky about that. It's like uh, Orlick is just screwed up. He can't think logically about. It. So when he when he blames, um, it's like his illogic there is similar to his illogic and is his l lack of logic in blaming. Um, Pip for the murder of his uh, his sister. It's like I didn't do it; you did it. You know, <laughs> wait a minute. You know, the worst logic there. So anyway, so an example of that is another example of that is when he he calls Pip sneaky for have for writing sneaky. He blames Pip for being sneaky for right having one script, but Compison is like a genius apparently for being able to forge fifty. You know. It's really sort of, it's really strange. I think it's possible that Orlick is referring to how Pip got Orlick fired from Status House. Exactly. Which is a real setback for Orlick. By, by not doing oh, it yeah. directly, yeah. yeah. Well, he, he, told, he told Jagger and Jagger fired him. So he was sneaking that way. He didn't do it directly. He kind of hid, be, but he didn't really want him to get fired, Jagger. He just complained to Jagger and Jagger fired him. 
<laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does anyone know what Biddy means when she tells Pitt that Orlick dances at her? That's a phrase that's uh, completely gone out of use, but she's she's obviously disturbed by it and and that that upsets Pitt. But what is that? He dances at me. <laughs> He's trying to hit on her. It must be something like that. Yeah. Glenna and then Alexis. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to the you did it. It seems to me this is, I, and John, I, just when you said it, it just this came to me that Pip as he narrates his own story, he talks about being raised by hand, but he doesn't really talk about in any detail what it was like to be an abused child. The feelings he must have had to resent and get angry. Um, and it's in this moment in the sluice house when um, Orlick says, you did it, it's Orlick has observed all the bottled up rage that Pip has can't articulate about being abused and intuits that Pip must have had a lot of rage in him about the way his sister treated him, or so it seems to me. So Orlick is an externalization of Pip's rage over his early abuse. Right. I mean, it seems to me that's one possible interpretation of you did it. Alexis. Uh, you know, when he's talking about dancing at Biddy, he he was also taken with Mrs. Joe. I mean, there's that element of sexual threat in, in both cases. And, um, you know, Joe was always going on about how, I mean, Mrs. Joe is this fine figure of a woman, you know. Uh, we see her as the monster older sister, but apparently she, she had her attractions. And... Uh, <laughs> With Orlick, as with Compasson, and as with uh, Miss Havisham, you, you fixate on revenge, and maybe you actually achieve your revenge, but in the way of doing it, you've destroyed yourself. You know, so fixating on revenge. Mrs. Joe was always putting down Orlick, you know, so he, he wanted to revenge himself on her, but also on Pip, but in the process, he's ruined his life. And that's what that's what fixating on revenge does to a person. Yeah, I I, I love that scene between in the sluice house. Orlick is trying to build up courage to kill Pip. It's almost like the very early scene, a harrowing scene where uh, Bill Sykes kills Nancy. Bill is doing it because partly because he thinks that Fagan and others expect him to do it. It's, it's, but there's a something almost touching about it. I'm going to have your life, wolf. But then he has to drink, drink some more brandy to build up his courage and never, finally never has a chance to do it. Yes. <laughs> and Dorothy. Is it, it's a Dorothy, yes. The phrase dances on there is an expression to dance attendance on. I'm wondering if that doesn't have the, the connotation you're looking for. I think it's something close to that, yes. Is it significant that Orlick basically gets away? He ends up, does he end up killing Pumblechook? 
Well, that's a, I'm sorry, that's next time, maybe later on, but, but Orlik is, if I remember rightly, uh, is not pursued, doesn't have to pay for what he's attempted anyway, or done. You know, we haven't paid much attention to what Pip is doing uh, all this time. We've been focused on Miss Havisham and Orlick and, uh, uh, and and some of the and Biddy, uh, but there's a lot that Pip is doing from beginning with saving Miss Havisham by putting out the fire and um, Pip. Pip is making plans. Pip has con interesting conversations with. Uh, Jaggers, uh, Pip uh, uh, is making financial arrangements. Uh, he's planning the escape for Magwitch. He's uh, doing a kindness for his friend Herbert. Uh, we we need to talk a little bit more, I think, about what what Pip is doing. One section that you didn't mention that fascinated me. He wants to find as much as he can about the Stella. It's really important for him to find yes. things about the Stella. And the section where he realizes that the Stella is a daughter, uh, what's her name? The daughter of uh, <coughs> Molly. Ma Molly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, 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 is there is a small section at the beginning, like he looks at her hands and he looks at her look, the way she looks, and it reminds him of a Stella. But in chapter nine, there is a whole paragraph. It wasn't just one thing that made him. A, a realize it and there is a whole pretty complicated paragraph that I didn't understand it completely but uh, he, he describes different events so I think there were cases that he looked at Stella and was reminded of Molly and then looked at Molly and eventually he says something uh, I thought how one link of association had helped that identification in the theater and how such a link wanting before had been reverted for me now when I had passed by chance, by a chance of, there was a sequence of events and he, I, I, I didn't completely follow it, but there is a sequence of complicated events that uh, made him conclude that Molly is the mother of Estella. Interestingly, it's through the hands, at least in part, that that identification yeah. is made. And this this novel is is obsessed with hands, brought up by hand, and uh, Pitt burns his hands. And many yeah, he says hand and the look and the sharp look that yes. they had, the way they looked. But but he he kind of summarizes his conclusion based on several cases. So I don't know. It, in chapter nine, there was a big paragraph when he summarized it. <laughs> yeah. So Virginia and then Margaret. Yeah, I think it's interesting in this section of the book, Pip in the beginning, everything is happening to Pip. But now Pip seems to be taking actions. Of them, so there's a transformation there where suddenly he's more in charge of his own life. So he's finding out everything about Estella and he's making plans to help Magwitch escape. And he's making plans to help Herbert, you know, get off to a good life, even if things don't work out for him. He's going to Miss Havisham to work out things for her. He really starts to take much more control of his life. Whereas in the first half, things happen to Pip. And now Pip is making things happen um, and trying to, you know, do things for other people. Yes, I think, I think, Pip in, in this section that we've read for today is uh, is uh, beginning to take more um, responsibility and action instead of being just a passive participant in a story that is arranged for him by other people. Margaret. And, and yes, what a strong action he does take when he visits Mr. Jaggers or he meets Mr. Jaggers on the street inadvertently and he, fo and he follows him to the office and goes to dinner with 
with him and Wemmick and reveals, especially to Mr. Mr. Jaggers, that Estella is Magwitch's daughter or the, uh, the daughter of Tom, Dick or Richard. <laughs> you, you know that, that scene, right? It's, it's an intriguing scene about what's going on between uh, Mr. Jaggers and Mr. Wemmick. Yes. Well, so, it's so, it's so it's so uh, complicated, and it's so uh, so much in need of some explanation here. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> All. Who who wants to unpack that that scene, that wonderful scene? It's it's a comic scene too. W Wemmick always has a touch of comedy uh, yeah. Yeah. about him. <laughs> Wemmick's concealed his uh, Walworth self from Jaggers pretty successfully until Pitt spills the beans. And Jaggers is amazed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of a, a scene in uh, Little Dorrit, and I cannot remember that uh, Arthur Clennam is being challenged by a young man and Arthur Clennam is all frozen up and won't, will not communicate with the young man. And maybe someone will remember who that is. He's, but the, the young man says, no, no, you just can't brush me off that way. You must, you must answer me. You must respond to me. <laughs> That's kind of what's going on here with Pip and Jaggers. To me, it's very interesting, interesting psychologically. Uh, how Pitt says, you know, come be open and honest with me. <laughs> Jaggers is the lawyer who knows everything. He knows the secrets of other people. And in this scene, Pitt knows something that Jaggers doesn't know. So. Sarah, and then Glenna. You for my name? Sarah, go ahead. Uh, um, well, I wanted to mention uh, something else, but we can go back to this scene. But the other thing that I thought was amazing is his relationship with uh, with um, Provis, with Magwitch. And uh, we talked in, in the last session. I wasn't there, but I, I listened to the audio. And uh, he says here, I had, I had quite determined that it would be a heartless fraud to take more money from my patron in the existing state of my uncertain thoughts and plans. So he, he, he didn't know yet how, how he feels uh, for Provis, and he thought it would be fraud. It won't be honest to take money from him. So this is very mature and very thoughtful. And uh, and and uh, we talked before about uh, uh, Provis uh, uh, becoming a little bit more tender and telling his, his life story, and and he has another sentence where he said, "It was never that hard for me to uh, say goodbye to him." He, he he starts to get to getting attached to Provis, which was is very interesting. They they start to have a relationship, a real relationship. But he feels, until I'm sure about this relationship, it's not honest to take money from him, which is wonderful, yeah. Yes, that's another important change in Pip's relationship yeah. to money and, uh, and to, to Provis Magwitch. Glenna. Yeah. You wanted to talk about women. We haven't really spent much time on women. And it seems to me that he is um, a dramatization of what you, I mean, in, in, well, modern scholars certainly theorize about the two spheres and whether there were, in fact, two spheres. But Wemmick is like the human embodiment of the public and the private. Um, he, his public sphere is his duty in, you know, Jackers' business. And then he separates. Um, his public sphere activity in, or tries to entirely these two different personalities 
uh, and, and all, you know, I'm just thinking about this whole spirit business, the great um, Indian uh, filmmaker, I think it was based on a Reverend Dranath Tagore story, The Hole in the World. Uh, the Hole in the World, I mean, and women is all about that, and it's such an interesting way of playing with that theme. And then, of course, in this scene, we're talking about uh, the barrier is artificially broken down by by them. And one of the things I want to say while I the floor, I in this rereading, I suddenly remembered that when I was in high school, my best friend and I read Great Expectations, and we were so taken with women that we began to refer to our own parents as the age of P. <laughs> Glenna, your sound was breaking up a little bit there. I'm not sure if there's, uh, if your Wi-Fi connection isn't secure or whether it's the microphone, but anyway, um, I, I, I think we managed to, to hear what you said. Um, uh, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, Virginia. Um, I think it's interesting, the conversation, so typical lawyer with jazz that everything's hypothetical, like hypothetically, if it's this or that, um, no great. And then his whole surprise, like that Wemmick has a private life. I love people that are at work that only think their whole lives are at work. And then suddenly he realizes that, what, you have like a parent, you do other things, you have another kind of a life. Um, and it was like such a surprise to Jaggers, who thinks he knows everything. He didn't even think about the fact that Wemmick might have a private life. And I thought that was one of the funnier parts of it. Um, that and constantly saying, you know, hypothetically, if it was this, because no lawyer's ever going to commit himself to anything in the way of, of talking about that. So it was an interesting way to bring about that whole story. And of course, another dimension of that is the, at least the suggestion that Jaggers has a private life as well. Uh, I mean, after all, he, he helped a woman in distress. He took in a, a daughter made a, a, a who had who who needed help. Uh, placed her. It didn't turn out too well in some respects. But but Jaggers acted in a kind in a kind way that you might not have expected from someone who's always professional. And again, Pip. Pip is being more assertive, and uh, it, you know, in the earlier scenes, Pip would never have been capable of standing up to Jaggers, taking the initiative, knowing, knowing some, telling Jaggers something that Jaggers doesn't know. So Pip's growth is is something we're able to track in this section of the novel. Sarah. And just two small things. So one that struck me is his ability to keep the secret is described so well, like uh, so that Jagger doesn't suspect that he got information from Wemmick. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing how he describes it in this scene. And also it shows maturity because he's really able to keep a secret. And the other thing that I pointed out, I thought about is that uh, when he gets a letter and he goes down to meet what turns up to be Oric, I think it's the first time that he doesn't consult with Herbert. Like every important step that he did, he, he got the advice from Herbert. And this is the first time that he does. Yes. And this by itself can mean several things. Yes, that's a good point too. Well, uh, I mentioned earlier that Pip and Herbert agree that Magwitch Provis softens, but I I think that's humorous, really, because <laughs> I think they're softening <laughs> and they're giving up some of their snobbishness and able to uh, see him for who he is and what he is. Well, this will come up next time that 
Pip will break the law in trying to get Magwitch out of the country. So that's uh, <laughs> that's for next week or next month, I guess. Sarah, did you have something else? Oh no, I was going to know it. <laughs> yeah, Margaret. That, yeah. Could we just talk a, a little bit about the wonderful play that Mr. Wopsle is in oh, yeah. and uh, the wild and crazy play that reminds me of off-Broadway in the 1960s here in New York <laughs> or there in New York. And uh, it, it was such a such a play. And I was thinking of it when you were discussing the plot of or this part, this section of Great Expectations. And what if uh, this play, this wild and crazy play, uh, is like a uh, a shadow of the plot of Great Expectations, you know, and how it came out of Dickens' head to put it on paper like that. I mean, he he was creating this other play too. I mean, he was creating the play that he presented in the, the scene with Mr. Wopsle. And, but of course the practical reason for it would be that uh, Compasson is sighted, seated behind Pip. So that is the, uh, that's the drive of the plot, I suppose. But still, we live, we live through and we experience this wonderful, wonderful play that's off the wall and and amazing. Any comments about that? Thanks, Lark. Uh, just this conversation piece is just uh, cohered in my brain briefly. Uh, secrecy and revenge and cruelty, and then inaction followed by action go, takes me back to the production of Hamlet earlier in the novel, uh, which was treated largely comically, but we do have the makings of a, of a revenge tragedy in this novel that may not go so badly <laughs> should, should make the right decisions, unlike Hamlet. Yes, nice observation, linking, linking inaction moving to action as a, a function of the plot. Peter. Oh, he's muted. Mute. Okay, it's a it's definitely a bizarre play. You know, it's like Dickens playing around with the uh, like let's let you know with the Tinker Toys, you know, <laughs> like narrative Tinker Toys, like just yeah, uh, and making fun of of of, of the melodramatic and pantomime, you know, tradition of the stage, you know, in Victorian England. What struck me though about about it was uh, the interesting point that the reason that um, Wopsle actually sees Compeyson is because he's been sidelined in the play. If you look at the places and the roles that he's been given, it's like he's been given non-roles non or like he's been, it's like the, the other actors or the director has said, oh, we've had enough of this guy. Let's give him a crappy role where he's sort of like on the, on the edge of the stage. So so at the same time that, you know, this play is very funny, uh, there's, a, there's an element, there's an element of, uh, you know, well, you know, more more damage to like uh, Wopsle's, you know, expectations because he's we finally see him. You know, at fine, he's finally got the roles that he's deserved. Like he's a non-entity on the stage and he's sitting in the corner and he's staring at the audience. You know, because he doesn't have a role to play. Really, people they've sort of sidelined him, so it's one more more damage to his his expectations. I never seen one. One of my students described for me attending a pantomime, I think at Christmas time in London, and said it was hilarious and wonderful. So at least then they were still doing it. But I think that's part of the fun in Dickens. There's always something else going on that's potentially very funny. And that's true in the pantomime, I think. I saw a chat went by too fast for me to see. Okay. Nope. Are there any loose ends we've left out or something anyone would like to pursue further? We've got five minutes here. Trab's boy <laughs> comes back. 
I have a thought. Go ahead. Yeah, who does, when he wakes up from unconsciousness, who does he see? Trav's boy. <laughs> well, why does he see Trav's boy? Because Trav's boy is always everywhere and inappropriate situations uh he just appears and i i i, I thought of it as a sort of a met uh, sort of a metafictional moment uh where where you know say you had to cut out character you had to cut characters out from your you know enormously big victorian novel so what do you do well you put them all in trab's boy you know so he's he's the convenient He's the convenient catch-all character. So, <laughs> so who's gonna who's gonna lead the who's gonna lead them to Orlick on the marches? Well, Trab's boys, of course, because <laughs> it couldn't be anybody else. It has to be the it has to be the character who shows up everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's the who's the uh, the convenient the convenient vehicle, you know, when you can't, you can't have like 600 characters. So Trav's boy, he shows up everywhere. He reminds me, well, what you say reminds me of Joe, the fat boy in uh, <laughs> Pickwick. the Pickwick Papers, who shows up everywhere. Damn, that boy's gone to sleep again. Here's Trav's boy. Only now he's an overactive young man, we're told. Yeah, there's something there's something metafictional about that. So like there's it's just like he's he's just and and of course why does there's something about about his his attitude towards Pip. Well he doesn't really hate Pip, it's just that he's like too enthusiastic. He wants to dance he wants Pip to set Pip to be to get like hurt or something, but it's not really because he means it, it's just because he's like an overactive character. So and he has an overactive. Wayne, at, it, at the beginning of today's session, one of the very interesting questions, at least interesting to me, that you asked was whether our pleasure in this section of the, the book comes from the story or whether it comes from the craft that is being demonstrated in the construction. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And I, 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 I wonder if we could perhaps in the last couple of minutes that we have left, uh, think more about that. And I'm thinking about Trab's boy in particular, that one, of, one piece of craft that Dickens enjoys, and it's not restricted to Dickens, but uh, is to bring back a character from earlier in the novel so that you tie up a little loose end. Why, why Trab's boy? Well, just to make a cameo appearance that the novel is unified, that the novel is together. And when Pip is on his way to the, uh, the lime kiln, the, the sluice house, he covers the same territory that was covered in the opening scenes of the novel. We're, yeah. we're repeating, we're going back over literally the same ground that we went over. He's seeing the same landscape, but with slightly different eyes. He's meeting many of the same characters. Orlick is showing up again. I mean, Orlick, Orlick had to show up. Uh, in this novel, in the same way that uh, Trab's boy had to show up a, a, again, this is—it's it, a novel that is carefully crafted. Yes, indeed. Um, so. Yes, I often regretted when I taught Great Expectations in high school that there were so many notes and so many movies because I remembered reading it the first time when I was young, and that when uh, Magwitch appears on those stairs halfway through. That's one of the great fictional experiences for me, and I, I didn't see it coming. There he is. He's back, and he is Pip's benefactor. Yes. That's spoiled now so often for readers who've seen it in the movies or read about it elsewhere. The past comes back. Yes, in an unexpected way. <laughs> the past is never past. That's right. <laughs> it's always, always with us, and it will come back to haunt us, to entertain us, to prove that our lives have some kind of significance and are not just random.
that's one of the things that art can do for us. Wayne, I think our time is up. We're up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, everyone. See you next month.